he's heading the NTTC uh, JIPMAR. And uh, he's continuously involved in human resource development and capacity building of educators in medical education and health professional education. Uh, also a famous uh, fellow, uh, which some of you might be familiar with. The, um, in today's of center management, if you feel that the patient is clinically stable, then you can probably get an idea. Dr. Ranveer, can you mute yourself, please? Uh, the patient deteriorates, then do not. Conversely, given the poor survival for those who fail to have a good initial response, right? Sorry, just give us a moment. There are studies which says that if the patient responds initially to antibiotics, they have a good survival. And if the patient do not respond initially, <laughs> Sorry for that uh, background. So we request, I'll, I think uh, it was from one participant. So sorry for that. So we'll move on to the session on uh, an overview about the eight com modules in undergraduate. Thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Jay Prakash, for agreeing to come for this program and to help us in understanding uh, uh, eight com in a better way. Thank you so much. Hello. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah. So I'll start sharing my screen. Yes. Uh, very good afternoon to everyone. Uh, I think we have a mixed group of participants here. Uh, all our uh, faculty members, I hope all our faculty members from uh, recognized medical colleges. And... Uh, uh, because now it, it has become the talk of uh, each and every college since 2019 uh, when NMC introduced the new curriculum. Uh, the last curriculum that is in 1997, uh, if you look at the MBBS curriculum in 1997, um, it has all the essential, uh, what is it, the components uh, of uh, creating a better doctor. Uh, almost everything is there. The new curriculum is not something, uh, it is totally new. Only thing is they have restructured it, or I can say that it is uh, old wine in a new bottle. But only thing is certain things that are, that, that are not explicitly stated in the old curriculum has now been stated explicitly in the new curriculum. Say, for example, in those days, or you might have seen our stakeholders or our teachers, our seniors, our patients, patient attendants, or our own uh, family members talking about uh, um, compassion, empathy, or uh, altruism, care, care, caring, sharing, all these things. But... Uh, uh, all these things are uh, uh, just uh, what is a people talk about. But when you say about training medical graduates, uh, there is no provision in the curriculum to teach all these things. That is why it is called as a hidden curriculum. So all these days it has been a hidden curriculum. And you know what is a hidden curriculum? To implement an hidden curriculum or to make uh, uh, an hidden curriculum active, you need to have proper organizational climate or the organizational climate should be conducive, then only the hidden curriculum will uh, work. So, but usually this does not happen. And you know, with the mushroom growth of medical colleges, and now India has uh, more than 650 medical colleges, and you know the strength of the medical students coming out uh, every year, more than 85,000 to 90,000 students are graduating from India. And with this large mass of uh, colleges and the students, it is difficult to concentrate, uh, I mean, on the organizational climate. Of course, it is an essential thing. But now the need of the heart is to incorporate these elements in the curriculum in a more systematic way. So that is, that comes the, uh, what do you say, the purpose or there comes the role of EDCOM. So with this uh, short background, I'll move on to the objectives of this session. At the end of this session, you should be able to identify the components of attitude, ethics, and communication module. And you should be able to acknowledge the contents of the EDCOM booklet. I think you would have already got a copy of that EDCOM booklet. And appreciate the use of the booklet. Now,
Sir, I think we lost you. We can't hear anything. Different people have different uh, uh, idea about curriculum. Why it is called as a curriculum? Is it only content? It is only the methods? It is only the assessment? Or all? Or apart from that, is there anything else there in the curriculum? Can I have some response? I think this is post-lunch session. <laughs> this is one drawback that we face in the online session. At least some interaction should be there. Either you write, post it in the chat box or you can interact with us. Yes, sir. Usually after a minute, uh, we usually get responses in the chat box. Yeah. So just for no a No problem. Minute. I'll wait. Uh, you would have heard different meaning for curriculum. So just pause. Don't worry about uh, whether it is right or wrong. Just I want some responses from that, that will help me to uh, carry on with the uh, uh, what is a my session. Carry on with the discussion. So what is a curriculum? Whether it is a private document or a public document. A curriculum is a public document, and each and every teacher and student or all stakeholders are expected to possess a copy of this curriculum. Why you know? Because when you look at the curriculum, there are a lot of things given in a curriculum uh, uh, about what is the objectives of the course, what, expect, what are the expected outcomes of the course, and uh, uh, how, how to deal with the content, how to check whether the contents are taught or not, how to check whether we are I mean, uh, achieving the expected outcomes or not. All these things are stated in the curriculum. But when you say curriculum, most of the people only look at the content. When you say curriculum, yes, someone is posting it as curriculum is set of guidelines. Very good, Dr. Umesh. So similarly, usually when we say the word curriculum, the first thing that comes to mind is the content. Even as teachers, when we receive the curriculum, only we really directly jump out to the uh, units or the uh, syllabus, the contents, and we plan accordingly. Okay, how many hours I have? How, to, how am I going to teach this? That is the only thing that happens. But curriculum is not that alone. Because curriculum is something that the overall experience that you provide to a learner under the umbrella of a recognized institute or under the, under the umbrella of a reputed institute. When you say reputed institute, uh, when a big institute becomes reputed is when the institute follows a curriculum in true spirit. Because most of the time what happens is Curriculum is certain, it's a document that is set aside and they teach something in the classroom and something is being assessed. That is why it is said that declared curriculum. Have we lost you? the reason why now the as i said the, the world curriculum also in 1990s and every all elements are there to create a better doctor but certain elements are not since see because once certain things are not explicitly stated we question it is not there in the curriculum why should i follow so same thing happened in the world world curriculum and then now the nmc has come out clearly with what is to be taught with regard to the attitude communication and the ethics uh, with reference to the undergraduate medical curriculum. So what is the formal curriculum? In a Sir, we are losing your voice in between. Uh, what about the other participants? Are you able to hear now? No. Okay. Thank you. Uh, sir, uh, you are muted and we lost you in between. Uh,
Yes. Can I start from here? Y yes, sir. Yeah, this is where I live. Okay. Um, so the current strategy is inadequate. Inadequate in the sense, uh, it is not it is not adequate to prepare the doctors. So if you ask a patient, he will he or she will expect something. Sir, if you ask a doctor, yes. Sorry, yes, sir, we are losing you in between the voice. Uh, we are completely losing you in between the uh, yeah. When you uh, your video is stuck and then we are unable to hear anything in between. I think uh, I, my from my side the kind of, I mean the, uh, what do you say the signal is better. Okay. It's okay. I don't know. Is it okay now? The audio and video quality. Now it is okay, but in between four or five okay. times we lost you. Uh, okay. Wait, I'll I'll inform you, sir, if we lose you again. Sir? So the curriculum should strike a balance. So we're still unable to hear you. But, but you see, if you look at the history of medical education in India, at the time of independence, India had some 12 medical colleges producing just about 1,200 or 1,250 graduates a year. In those days, medical college was the only source for the graduates, I mean the medical medicos. Medical college was the only source, the teachers in the medical college was the only source and very little text were available. available. Unless they come to the college regularly, meet teachers, meet patients, meet patient attenders, they don't, they cannot, what is a acquire proper attitude or knowledge. Like any other graduates coming out of any arts and science college. Why I'm saying this thing is. We are only looking at the output, not the outcome of the medical education. When I say output, it is nothing but the mark or the number of graduates that uh, who pass out from a medical college or number of graduates pass out on the whole in the nation. It is only just output. And again, if I say output, we only look at how many numbers of classes have been taught, how many hours they have attended, how many practical sessions were conducted. So it is just output, number of candidates passed. When you say outcomes, which is explicitly stated in the curriculum, outcome is what behavioral changes the students who are coming out have acquired. Have they acquired desirable qualities? Sir, uh, sir, we are unable to hear you. It's not happening. Sir. Uh, again, we are losing you in between. I think it is not the network. Is it something to do with the voice, the device that you are using? I am using a earphone. Uh, I think it should be working. Because sometimes you, it's completely blank. Uh, we can't hear anything. It's. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's network. Okay. It's I think completely gone at many. Okay, I'll remove the, this thing now. You please let me know. Sure, uh, sir. Is it audible now? Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. Okay, and I'm not using the microphone. Uh, this thing, uh, head mics. Uh, so that is it. So where I stop, uh, I was talking about the uh, the uh, at the time of independence, India had this thing and uh, all those things. Now, most of the time we look at only the output, that is the number of students passed, but we don't look at the outcomes, that is the behavior, whether they have acquired the qualities of a good doctor or whether they have acquired the qualities expected out of a doctor, the kind of doctor that, that, that we are uh, trying to produce. So that is the outcome. And the third level is the impact, which, which the impact, I mean, the presence, whether the presence of uh, uh, the doctors we produce make their presence felt in the environment they were, or they, whether they have an impact on the patient, patient outcome, patient healthcare outcome, whether they have an impact on the community. These two things usually we don't look at. The problem is with the curriculum. Okay, so considering all these things, the NMC has come out with a curriculum that is uh, more uh, strategic and more explicitly stated objectives, especially with regard to the soft skills. 
And if you look at the NMC curriculum, they expect the Indian medical graduates to play five roles. That is, uh, we can even call it as a five-star doctor. Uh, the five-star doctor, the five roles expected are the clinician, role of a clinician, the role of a communicator, the role of a um, uh, uh, member of a team in the member of healthcare team, they are expected to play an effective role in the in a healthcare team. And the next role is the professional role and the final role is they are expected to be a lifelong learner. So except the role of a clinician and lifelong learner, all other, all the rest three roles are about the soft skills, professional, communicator and a member of a team or leader of a team. These three skills are, it is these three skills makes a doctor a better doctor or these three skills that makes a doctor more productive it is these three skills that brings recognition to a doctor so and it is these three skills that bridges the knowledge and at skill of a doctor these three skills a doctor may have adequate knowledge and skills but unless if they don't possess these three skills they cannot Okay, I mean, they cannot perform uh, as a better doctor because it is these top, soft skills or the attitude that bridges the gap between the knowledge and the skill. So that is why revitalizing the professionalism is very, very essential. And the best methodology is providing experiential learning to the learners. So what do you mean by experiential learning? In experiential learning, you provide opportunity for the learners to experience certain things. All these days, we are only talking about empathy, compassion, altruism, caring, sharing, cooperation, collaboration, all those things. But are we allowing, giving opportunity for our learners to experience all these things? Is there enough time within this five and a half years program or four and a half years program, excluding the internship? Is there enough opportunity or time uh, available to provide all these things? So what would be the best method? So in experiential learning, we give opportunity to experience a certain thing and then make the learner to reflect on their experience and then think about what went well, what could have done better or how they, why they did, when learning happened and where learning happened, how learning happened. happens in an experiential learning. So how to provide this experiential learning with regard to inculcating the professionalism among the medical graduates, Indian medical graduates. So that is the question now. Okay. Now, for that, you need a cognitive base. What you are going to teach? How are you going to teach? Uh, what, uh, what type of content will be more, what is a reliable to make, uh, um, to make the learners to understand all these components with regard to professionalism and what kind of experiential learning there are different kinds of experiential learning so experiential learning can be given at home or uh, in the hospital or individually or in a group or with patient without patient depending on the resource there are different types of resources available for experiential learning okay so that how are we going to provide this experiential learning and how are you going to make it whether it is going to be a one time affair or is it going to be a, a continuous affair or how are we going to approach this experiential learning and the next thing is how role modeling because role modeling those days i said college was the only source teachers were the only source of inspiration but Sir, uh, we can't hear you again. And in your action. So that, then you keep, what is a, uh, executing that by the um, What kind of mentorship will help students to hone their communication skill, hone their professional skills, hone their uh, other clinical skills, especially with regard to their attitude towards patient and professionalism? So the, these are the questions in mind. So this, this requires revitalization. That is where the role of experiential learning comes. So all these days, still the new curriculum comes, all these days, all these subject competencies uh, uh, we were taught in silos. That is uh, why we call the previous curriculum as
Sir? Output, that is the content. But now in the new curriculum, what happens is all these subject competencies are converted into uh, global competencies, or specific global competencies such as clinician, the role of a team member, communicator, lifelong learner, and professional. Now I have connected uh, myself through the desktop. Yes, sir. Uh, sir, and uh, now we can see your name, but that is muted. So, okay, fine. Is it audible, man? Now, yes, sir. Yes, audible. Okay, right. So, this model now, the MSC, NMC, I said, has come out with a beautiful model, which is called as the ACOM model, Attitude, Ethics, and Communication model. And now it uses proper idea about what to be taught, how to be, to be taught, who will do what, and how, it is, how things have to be uh, assessed, all these things. So that is the... Uh, so now why this model? Is this slide changing? Uh, it is with the ADCOM front page. Now it oh, is changed. Right. Now it's changed. Oh, okay. Now, my this model, the purpose of this model is to explicitly uh, state the content, uh, the method, and the assessment pattern to assess professionalism among uh, medical graduates. Now, coming to uh, the uh, module, the structure of the module. So, the first question is who? Who are going to? Who are going to learn? And who is going to teach? So, as we all know that the learners are our MBBS students, and who are going to teach are our teachers. And there are a lot of controversies, a lot of uh, what is a doubts among the medical colleges and the teachers about who will teach all these things. So, since the preclinical people are going to address the students in the initial years, or, or in other, otherwise, you can say the students need the preclinical people uh, in the uh, that is the preclinical people are people who are going to handle the students in the first year. So, the preclinical teachers are the right people to. Uh, handle this ICOM model. So there are the reasons are many which I don't have to explain. I think you know the reason. And uh, the next thing is, what will be taught? So the contents have been clearly given the ICOM model. What is to be taught? And it is only suggestive. It is not prescriptive. And you can identify your own content. With content in the sense related contents as per as suggested by the NCI uh, or in the NMC. Clearly given the schedule also, teaching schedule, which is spread longitudinally across all the four years, starting from the first year till the fourth year. And that schedule I will show you how, how it is it is spread accordingly and how it is to be assessed and how it is to be taught and how it will be assessed. Those things have also been given, uh, uh, have been suggested by the MC. Now let us move on to the next slide. Uh, this, I think you can look at the booklet. I'll give you the link where you can download the booklet and then uh, uh, know about uh, the structure of the booklet. So it contains four sections. One is the first section has goals, roles, and universal competencies as envisaged by the graduate medical regulation. So the goals, I told you, the five goals, the, uh, the goals is to, the main goal is to what? Provide healthcare to all. And the doctors whom we produce to be able to play the five roles of Indian medical graduate and uh, the universal competences have been clearly stated in the curriculum uh, as a clinician what competences they are expected to demonstrate and as a communicator what is expected out of them as a lifelong learner what is expected out of them and as a professional what so everything has been clearly stated in the uh, section one and the NMC has uh, given a, um, uh, what is a the uh, suggested uh, teaching modules which has scenario 
Basically, it is a scenario based model. model. Why we have chosen scenario, scenario based model? Uh, can someone uh, uh, throw some insights on this? Have you ever uh, handled a scenario based model or have you, have you been exposed to scenario based teaching learning? What is the advantage of using scenario based uh, uh, teaching learning? Can someone throw a light on this? Anyone in this group uh, have tried this teaching methodology using scenarios? And I'm sure you might have seen this in the FCPM sessions that you recently underwent, how we used case scenarios. So it will be great if you can share your thoughts about it. When there are different methods available, why the NMC stresses more on the scenario base? What is the advantage? There are many advantages uh, in using a scenario base, using a case or case, case scenario. What is it? The same, say for example, you have a content, the same content can be dealt in different ways. You can give a short lecture, you can show a video, you can make a role play. And uh, there are different ways of dealing uh, the same content. You call it as uh, uh, pluralism, pl pl pluralize the presentation. But usually we, we go to the classroom only with a uh, small, take a PowerPoint and then go to the classroom. So that is not pluralizing, uh, uh, pl pluralizing the presentation. So when you say pluralization of the presentation, same content delivered in different modes. And there are certain methods which are proved to be more effective uh, to certain uh, contexts. And especially with regard to attitude development, with regard to professionalism, scenario-based uh, teaching learning method has been proved effective because a scenario has, is in the, as, as a whole, uh, it, Use a what is a holistic learning experience to the learner. A scenario has certain elements that makes the learner to know. Uh, say, for example, uh, people who have undergone this DLS, ALS course, they start with a scenario, isn't it? So the first one is the uh, mechanism of injury. Mechanism. What is the mechanism? And next one is what injury has taken place. And what is the uh, signs and symptoms and what treatment modality can be followed. This is the structure for a scenario that people, people use in a uh, BLS or ATLS course, isn't it? So, miss, we call it as this mechanism, injury, signs and symptoms are uh, the treatment options. Of it. Similarly, if you want to teach uh, students about a headache, a case with a headache, so you can build up scenario, a holistic scenario where you can make the student or the learner to learn about the the whole uh, thing about a headache, or the, uh, about anemia, or about uh, liver, functions of the liver, so all these things. So the scenario provides a holistic opportunity to the learner to understand certain events or certain disease, and then come out with their own uh, reflection. So that is, the, that is why scenario-based education is considered to be the best method for teaching professionals. Especially when it comes to professionalism, scenario based education will help a lot. And the next thing is about the competition, uh, competence acquisition logbook pattern. They have also suggested a logbook pattern like portfolio. So here it provides opportunity for the learners to record all their learning events. Whatever learning events starting from morning till evening till they go out of their duty, will they get opportunity to record. So that gives them an opportunity to look back after going off or next day they look back and then see what kind of experience, learning experience they underwent in the previous day. So that will help them to what? Prepare for the current situation and prepare for their next session, next learning event. And desirable competence, they have, they have identified 54 competencies which are called as the desirable competencies. Out of 54 desirable competencies, 39 competencies are considered as core competencies, which any MBBS students must learn and then they must be assessed for. So that is why they are called as core competencies. Rest of the competencies are called as desirable competence. Okay, so that is one thing. Then the next thing is about core and non-core competencies in NCOP. What is this core and non-core? As I said, 54 competencies are there, 39 are core and uh, 34 are core and rest are non-core competencies. When you say core competencies, these competencies should be observed and assessed. But non-core competencies can be observed and then feedback can be provided. So they may, not, may or may not be considered for assessment or for certification. 
When you see core competencies, they should be assessed and they should be considered for certification. So that is the purpose of having core and non-core competencies. And they have given a model tool, especially for assessing the communication tool, uh, tool which you would have, uh, it's a popular tool. I think most of you would have uh, heard about that tool, Kalamazoo Consensus Statement for assessing the communication skill of the uh, learners. So that is the uh, tool they are given. There, there are a lot of tools available for assessing the three, uh, the soft skills of the learner, to assess leadership quality, to assess their communication skills, to assess their learning, self-directed learning ability, to assess their uh, lifelong learning. There are tools available for that. So you can also develop your own tool or improvise your own uh, by looking at the standardized tools. And coming to the content, as I already said, so the content is based on the uh, five roles of the Indian medical graduate, the functions of Indian medical graduate, so which already have discussed, the role of a clinician, leader, communicator, lifelong learner, and professional. Now, how are these contents distributed? So they have been uh, distributed longitudinally for the four professional year. In professional year one, five modules, and the hours allotted is 34 hours. Professional year two, there are eight modules with 34 hours. Professional year three, five modules and 24 hours. And professional year four, nine modules with 45 hours. Now look at the uh, governance. How this curriculum, at more, uh, at more curriculum is governed? And who will govern this? How it is governed uh, are aligned in the curriculum? So in professional year, year one, first year, you have four modules, sorry, five modules. So the first module talks about what does it mean to be a patient. See, the first four modules, I'm telling about the JIPMA experience, how we do in JIPMA. In JIPMA, the first four modules are covered as part of the foundation course. We have a 15 days foundation course. In this foundation course, we cover the first four modules as part of the foundation course. What does it mean to be a patient? The exercise here is, we give this exercise to the student as group work, as, as individual as well as group work. We, it, it, it is in the form of uh, uh, writing, but they will uh, uh, say what, uh, uh, what does it mean to be a patient. They will describe a patient, or they will tell their experience of being a patient of themselves, or they will they describe the uh, patient in their home. So this will give them an opportunity to understand who a patient is. That is the first step in professionalism. They should be able to describe who is a patient. So there are different activities to engage students to make the to make them to understand the concept of uh, understand who a patient is. So you can also improvise your own. Then what does it mean to be a doctor? Here also again they will describe the qualities of a good doctor. What kind of quality they expect from a doctor? And uh, when if they are a patient, what kind of uh, response they get from a doctor and what qualities they expect from all these things they will come up. So this is again another exercise. And Canada is the first teacher, which already you might be more aware of, aware, aware. and how a cadaver can be used as a teacher, how to treat a cadaver. The, the question to be asked is how a cadaver can help, serve as a teacher for the student. So they themselves will come out and say, so this way I can use a cadaver, and the teachers will moderate uh, the session. So the main thing is they should learn how to treat that cadaver. So the attitude they show towards a cad cadaver. Uh, will get transmitted when they see a real patient. That is why we give more opportunity for the learners. The learners enter an exercise where they will say how they are going to treat the cadaver, the privacy of the cadaver, whether they will pull or pull, just like they treat the cadaver like a mannequin or not. So all of these things they will come out, they will discuss and then find the larger group. So this is again another exercise that we give during the foundation course and doctor patient relationship. What kind of relationship they expect from a doctor when they go as a patient? So is that uh, communication alone? Is that caring alone? What kind of empathy they expect from a doctor? What kind of response they expect? How responsive a doctor should be? All these things, uh, even they come up with better points than the faculty members, moderate. So that was really a, a, a what is a eye-opener session for many of our faculty. So doctor patient relationship. So all these things will be covered in the thing. And the little bit of communication skill will also be developed, I mean, covered as part of the communication module of foundation course. And we also teach them the local language. That is, here in uh, the local language is Tamil. Uh, we teach them uh, Tamil language for two days and make them to converse a uh, little bit in Tamil. So at the end of the Tamil language session, they also, because 
It is the local language that helps the medical graduate because the treatment has a diversified uh, uh, to student diversification is that is that's like a mini India. We get students from different parts of the country. So communication is a big challenge for our students. So we give more importance for teaching them the local language so that they become comfortably uh, moving around in the college, moving, talking to their friends and communicating with their uh, with the patients and other uh, stakeholders. So this is how we do in Jinpa. So professionally, one has five modules. First four modules are completely covered in the foundation course. Communication module is stretched till one year. Then who does this job? So usually the preclinical departments are interested with the responsibility of executing the ACOM module on rotation basis. First three years, so right now the, the responsibility is with the anatomy department. So once the anatomy department, I mean, Cover, completes three uh, years, the, it will be handed over to the uh, biochemistry or physiology department. But though this is the, the responsibility is interested to the to one department, the teaching is a collective responsibility of all the department, all the three departments in consultation with the clinical departments. So again, so the people have many questions about whether it is essential to involve the clinical people, not essential because. The pre clinical, I mean, the pre clinical people are also doctors. They know many, many of the things, except for certain critical areas. When there is a real need for a clinician to come and take the echo model, definitely they can be involved. Otherwise, the pre clinical teachers themselves can teach this module if they are more comfortable. But when they prepare the scheme of work, when they prepare the session plan, it should be in consultation with the clinical team. There should be consultation. The, the core clinical people here are the medicine, OG, pediatrics, and sometimes ortho and EMS. So the core people are the general medicine people, surgery, and OG, pediatric, pediatrics people. So especially medicine and surgery department should be consulted when they prepare the session plan. Then coming to the year two, same thing happens here. So working in healthcare system, this also part of this also is covered in the first year exam as part of a uh, foundation course. And what does it mean to be a family member of a patient? And uh, healthcare as a right, all these things are, little bit of these things are covered in the foundation course. And it is longitudinally covered by the, covered in the uh, second year also. And more importance is given to the medical, legal, ethics, and communication skill. Again, see, communication skill is spread across the, all the four years. So 34 hours are allotted for phase two. And phase three, uh, two modules uh, 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 are allotted for communication skill, and three modules are medical legal and ethics. So how is this done? Phase three and phase four. Again, though the title is prepared by the uh, preclinical people, and it is uh, what is they executed by the uh, clinical people. So for example, students when they go for early clinical exposure. I think you might have heard about, uh, I think most of you will be following this early clinical exposure, uh, which is again part of first year, phase one. And when it comes to second year, it is called as uh, student doctor method of teaching. When you say student doctor method of teaching, it is early clinical experience. Early clinical exposure is first year, early clinical experience, that is student doctor method of teaching, starts from second year. When they go to the second year, Though the session plans are prepared by the preclinical people, it is executed by the uh, faculty members from the clinical uh, side. Because when, they, when the students go to the clinics, they, they go, uh, they, uh, they come to see the patient or their sessions are early clinical student doctor method of teaching is uh, dealt in different method. Uh, one with the patient, uh, without the patient, they use a case and uh, the, some cases are taken for decision, I mean discussion, and that way the uh, student doctor method of teaching is also. So this is how the ECOM module is done, and there is no uniform pattern followed in uh, follow, followed across all the colleges. Uh, in Jitman, we follow this kind of uh, method, but colleges are free to uh, what is it use their own method, provided uh, these things are covered as uh, primary content. Especially, what does it mean to be a patient, doctor, cadaver as teacher, working in healthcare system, healthcare as a right, communication skill, medical legal, and ethics. So you see that these are covered adequately, and more important is this thing. 
So when you plan your session plan, you see the faculty and the students understand uh, the background information given in the model and which competency you are going to address. So for example, if it's a communication model, if uh, there are different competencies given, the student should be able to elicit proper history. That is one competency. So you should make sure whether the background information is in the history, uh, uh, eliciting history, whether the student gets enough opportunity to demonstrate eliciting history from the uh, case. So is there a case? So you have to either follow the case given in the echo model, or you can prepare your own case and see, uh, circulate it among your experts and then get it better. And after that, you can use that case. And points for discussion. What points you are going to take for discussion? So it is, it should be in alignment with the objective. So if the objective is the competency to elicit history from a patient, it should address most of the roles you expect from a uh, Indian medical graduate. See the five roles. Now, whenever you break the objectives into, I'm sorry, the competencies into objectives, you should see that which of the roles, of the roles uh, you are addressing. Say, for example, if the competency is related to communication, you should also see the role of a team leader is addressed or not. The role of a com uh, communicator is addressed, especially, I mean, that is the main role that they are going to address. The next role is the team leader. Are they effectively they are able to communicate? What uh, objective is there to, uh, I mean, uh, to accept whether they are an effective member in communicating their, in communicating information in their team. So that one should also be seen. Then the next one is about town. Uh, what is that town? Uh, third one, professional. Uh, so whenever you break the competencies into objectives, you see that most of the roles are addressed, not one particular role. People usually think that when they break down the objectives, I mean, uh, competencies and objectives, they have to address only one role that is clinician or communicator or uh, professional. No. As much as possible, you should cover all the, uh, what do you say, uh, convert all the objectives into five objectives covering all the five uh, roles. If, if certain roles are not possible, you can do. So you try to address the maximum number of roles as possible. Then the next role is the assessment methods. The NMC has suggested certain assessment method that is given at the end of uh, each uh, uh, module. Uh, some are uh, for formative or some are for assessment. Again, uh, you can ask, you, usually I get a frequently asked question is that uh, whether there is a provision for summative assessment. Is uh, any question can be included in the summative university question? Yes, of course. Now, NMC has suggested that a minimum one question can be included across all the phases in all the papers. Whether it is may be preclinical or paraclinical or clinical or surgical discipline, I mean medical or surgical discipline, whatever it is. Whenever you set a question paper, please see that at least one question comes, one question is from the ad hoc model. May, may, it can be with respect to medical legal ethics, medical legal or ethics, or it can be with respect to uh, communication, or it can be with respect to uh, lifelong learning, or it can be with respect to anything, any one of this. So please, yeah, after, as an examiner, if you set a question paper, at least the at least minimum five marks are allotted for at all. Five to ten marks, minimum five, maximum ten marks are allotted for this thing. And apart from that, you always have opportunity for formative assessment. So uh, you can always uh, observe and then give feedback to your learners, or you can use some assessment tools or ask your RP tools to observe and uh, give feedback to your learners. So whenever you care after, after listening to this session, whenever you come across your learners, please see that your observation is more focused with respect to these five roles. Are they playing the five roles adequately, rationally, and judiciously? And definitely, you should be in a position to give them adequate feedback, appropriate feedback to them. And the resources, there are a lot of resources available, and NMC has suggested resources. The NMC Edcom booklet itself is a resource, and they have also suggested resource material in that booklet. You can download and then make use of those resources. And you can also create resources. Coming to the next one, so think of role modeling. All of us, Having taken up the role of a faculty, we have to prove ourselves as a role model wherever it is possible. And try to create scenarios. Your daily event, learning, workplace events are, I mean, uh, what is it, uh, can be a case-based case. 
So please record all the cases, record all the events, and you will definitely find a holistic case in your and cause uh, foster the habit of uh, observation among your learners so that each and every patient becomes a uh, what is a, a teacher part. You know, isn't it? So they are going to meet different patients every day. Each and every patient is going to become a teacher for them. Uh, foster the quality, I mean, foster, I mean, uh, what is it? Prepare your learners or encourage the learners to record all these events and ask them to come out with scenarios. Let them create scenarios. That also will provide opportunity for them to become better doctor, acquire the qualities, professional qualities. So don't think that always as a teacher, we have to provide a case. Students can create their own case based on, based on their experience. And case studies. So, so scenario based education it can be case based learning or problem based learning or problem based uh, can be problem solving. It says many uh, things are there which already have been given here. So, that is and reflect, provide opportunity for your learners to provide, I mean, uh, reflect on their learning experience that will help them to uh, hold their uh, reflective skills and professional skills. And self directed learning and right solving sessions can also be encouraged. So there are a lot of video cases, clips, and cinema education are there. There are some cinema uh, cinema clips, or uh, what do you say, uh, many films are there that will help you to uh, foster professionalism among your learners. The next thing is about the books, narrative stories are available. I think which you people may be more familiar than me. So you can also take them to a community. Here we used to take them to a uh, Arul Ashram. Where AIDS patients are uh, lodged. I mean, where uh, it is a what is a rehabilitation center for the AIDS, AIDS patient. It's called as the uh, law uh, So students get exposed to these AIDS patients. They talk to the AIDS patient. They come across oh the hardship that the AIDS patient uh, go through. All these things. So take them to a urban center, a rural health center, or a specialized center like AIDS care center, or uh, something like that. A specialized ward. The child care rehabilitation centers like that. So that will give them an opportunity to understand what professionalism is. And you can give them a mini project also. You can give them opportunity to prepare their own uh, skits or short movies like that. So medical camps can be conducted, portfolios. Uh, so already I discussed about this. Encourage the uh, to document their learning events in the form of a portfolio. But portfolio becomes effective only if you give your feedback. And if you take their own uh, feedback, okay. Otherwise, the portfolio just becomes the log book of uh, daily or uh, daily of uh, where you daily where it gives office only to enter the learning events. So, if a, a, a log book is accompanied with your feedback, then it becomes an effective portfolio. So, next thing is the, to summarize: uh, echo module is a case-based module. Underline the word case based. Why it specifically causes it's called this case based module? Because it provides a holistic opportunity, learning opportunity for the learners, because it is the case that uh, gives uh, what is a uh, proper learning experience. Because we call that the module is specifically used for uh, experiential learning. So you cannot always take your learners to the board or often, always you will not get a patient. But if you have a very effective case, it uh, gives life to the, I mean, uh, the uh, I mean, it brings in life to the learning experience. And case scenarios and discussion points are there in the module. And it is a structured program. Whenever you plan your session, see that it is structured. Then only you can easily assess the output and the outcomes as well as the impact. And it is distributed across all the four phases. And moreover, it also has an assessment component. You don't have to worry about whether it is to be, what is to be assessed, how it is to be assessed. So that is about uh, this. So if you have any questions, I'll be happy to take some questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, we are running shortly out of time. Uh, sorry, Dr. Reena. Uh, we'll just take a couple of minutes to answer some of the queries before uh, your session, if that is okay. Sure, sure. The participants have any questions uh, to Dr. JP, you can please ask. Uh, before the next program, next session, sorry. You can either unmute or you can type it in the chat.
I don't see any question in the chat. No, sir. No, sir. Not yet. Uh, maybe uh, we'll go back to the meeting. Go to the next session, probably. Mm -hmm. If there are any questions, please send us to the WhatsApp group also. We can get in touch with Dr. and uh, get back to you with his responses. Thank yes. you so much, sir, uh, for the session. Uh, thank you so much for sharing uh, the details about ATCOM to this group and uh, agreeing to be a part of this program. Okay, thank, thank you, you thank you for the opportunity and thank all the participants for the patient listening. I think there are some, uh, I think they have experienced some, you had some technical bridges. I don't know why, why it is like that. Uh, so sorry for that. Sorry sorry for that. that. If you have any questions, you are okay to post your questions in Italian India or Arabic in India, I'd be happy to respond to that. Respond to that. Uh, once again, thank you all for your passion listening and I thank Italian India for giving me this opportunity. Thank you a lot. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you. So we'll uh, quickly move to the next session. I would like to summarize what Dr. Jay Pradesh was telling, but maybe towards the end, or I'll send it that in the uh, in the WhatsApp group. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Rina, for waiting for another 20 minutes. So, and apologies for the delay. So we'll have uh, Dr. Rina, uh, Rina's session now. She is the head of the Department of Continuing Medical Education, CMC Vello. Uh, Ma'am's background is a radiation oncologist, and in 2004, she established palliative care unit at uh, CMC Vellore uh, till 2019. And she was also uh, the chief editor of IJPC, that is uh, Indian Journal of Palliative Care. Uh, th thank you, Ma'am, for uh, agreeing to be part of this program for another time. This is the second batch that we are seeing for uh, this faculty development program. Over to you, Ma'am, without delay. Yeah. Thank you very much, Dr. Sri Devi. Thank you all for going the extra mile and joining this program. I was very happy to see at least one person whom I know. So, all the very best. Right. Uh, anyway, over the next 40 minutes, um, I've been asked to tell you about. Uh, teaching about serious health related suffering. Uh, you can see my slide, isn't it? On slideshow? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Can you see my slide? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Now, the first question is uh, how, how many of you, just put it in the chat box, do you think it will be easy to teach this topic to students? Yes, yes, sir. Uh, Ma'am, you are muted now. We got one response, it is not at all. Uh, Ma'am, I think uh, you are. You have to unmute. Sorry. Some. I hope. Anyway, yes, we got one response which said it was uh, not at all, and I agree with you. I think I we lost Dr. Rina. Uh, we'll just wait for a minute for her to come back. Students is to enable them to identify dimension. The objective of our teaching uh, this session to medical students is to enable them to identify dimensions of serious health related suffering to list the benefits and burdens of interventions and to define potentially inappropriate treatment. Now, I... Ma'am, uh, 
so it's like it's like asking someone to design warm winter clothes for this man in this brutally cold weather when the only life they know is this life okay. so i think one of the problems is we are trying to teach serious health related suffering to medical students most of whom have not known much suffering at all i mean maybe the maximum suffering they've known is preparing for the neat or not getting good marks in the neat so what do we see here it's sort of like our students okay. we see people who are young who are healthy, who are ambitious, who are carefree, who are having fun, who have no serious illness, no severe pain. Even the women in the group have not yet gone through labor pain. And, uh, you know, so there's academic excitement for the studious ones, other forms of excitement for the less studious ones. And there in one afternoon session, we are trying to teach them about serious health related suffering. Not an easy task. So I think um, in order to engage them, I would probably start with a case scenario, which at least in some ways they can identify with, okay? So let us take the case scenario of a medical student who joined a private medical college two years ago. And this, is, and this was after a couple of unsuccessful attempts at NEET. And she's the first healthcare professional in her family. And her mother asked her to go to her uncle's house in the village and see her maternal grandmother. The grandmother is staying with the mother's brother in the village. So if you want, you can even make a little role play out of this. Okay? So the mother is telling the medical student, your grandmother had a stroke three months ago and she was admitted in the ICU for three weeks and she cannot walk and talk. You must go and help her. You are the only medical professional in our family. Well, this poor medical student says, what will I do, Amma? Why don't they admit her in another hospital? So then what does the mother say? So mother says, don't even suggest that to my brother, because everything that he had saved for your cousin's college education went with that hospital admission. So why this question about the cousin's college education? because that is a kind of financial toxicity, which maybe this medical student can understand. Okay. Um, and then you say, you know that your uncle's business ended during COVID, which also is a kind of financial stress that some of them may be familiar with. And then, you know, we are a respectable family and it is very difficult for your uncle when the neighbors say that the patient should be admitted in hospital. So the serious health related suffering, especially the, for the ones who are not very empathetic, like the ones we saw in our beachside picture, you show them a poor man who's suffering there. Oh, that is far away from my life. But this may be something they can think about a little bit. So we begin with the case scenario. And then anyway, so then we say this medical student goes to her grandmother's house and grandmother is there with her stroke and medical student can see that she has grade 3 hemiparesis. She can see that she has multiple painful ulcers in the mouth, so she does not quite know how to make a diagnosis. She can see that there's a pressure smore and there's sore and there's a bad smell. And she screams in pain when she tries to get her grandmother to move her limbs because she's beginning to get some contractures. So. And the grandmother is kept in a separate room in the house because of that smelly bed sore. Uh, the grandchildren are kept a little away because the daughters-in-law are worried that they'll get some infection from the smell. And the grandmother tells the granddaughter, I am unable to tolerate this existence. Please kill me and release me from this burden. Sometimes if it is appropriate, we can ask. Do any of you know somebody who has been in this situation? But we have to say that only if you feel comfortable about sharing it, because sometimes these can be traumatic 
memories and we should not force anyone to say that. That is why this case scenario is a hypothetical case scenario. Then we can ask them, what are the elements of suffering? It's nice if we can do it in think, pair, share, or if it's a physical class, ask them to just speak out, or even sometimes just write on a paper or a Google form or a chat box, but let them try and figure out what are some of the elements of suffering. And after they have come up with four or five, or if it's a group, they, they would have come up with more, ask them to classify you know, what is the physical, what is the emotional, what is the social, and what is the spiritual. I think it is much more meaningful for them if they come out with this list rather than if we preach to them. Okay. And then that can bring us to the definition of serious health related suffering. Suffering is health related when it is associated with illness or injury of any kind. Suffering is serious when it cannot be relieved without medical intervention and when it compromises physical so you know, there is nothing very tricky or complex about it. It just introduces that definition. But maybe they can believe it better because they have thought of this case. So this was the grandmother with a stroke. And then you can patients where you think patients may have serious health related suffering. And oh, hopefully they will come up with some things. Okay. And then after that, Maybe I might show them this graph, which has given a whole range of things where there is serious health related neoplasms to vascular to uh, organ failure, trauma, infection, metabolic. It's, it's not just cancer, it is not just elderly care. And then we can ask them, okay, you look at this graph and tell me that in the year 2016, how many people have serious health related suffering caused by cerebrovascular disease like this grandmother also give them a minute or two to look at that slide and you know these children are smart so they see okay blue is for 2016 and that is cerebrovascular disease and in 2016 cerebrovascular disease caused almost four and a half million deaths with serious health related suffering a huge huge number and that's just one of the diseases there's a whole lot more so that way we have introduced to them both the spectrum and the magnitude of serious health related suffering what can we do about serious health related suffering one of the things that palliative care, care can do is to relieve the serious health related suffering that is associated with life limiting or life threatening conditions or the end of life. Now this grandmother definitely has a life limiting condition and it is quite possible that with the next infection it might become life threatening as well. And then from that we can go on to the definition of palliative care which is the active holistic care of individuals across all ages with serious health related suffering due to severe illness and especially of those near the end of life. And sometimes there is some overlap between palliative care and rehabilitation and we don't have to, you know, get too tied down with jargons and boundaries. Basically, it's a human thing to do. And its aim is to improve the quality of life not only of the patient, but also their families and their caregivers. And the student can see how the uncle is struggling with questions, how the aunties are uh, frightened about what may happen, and the patient herself. And the goal is in such situations to help patients to live as full a life as possible until death by facilitating effective communication helping them and their families determine goals of care. Like here, in fact, what the grandmother is asking for is euthanasia. But that, of course, is not what we are going to teach. But the goal of care for the grandmother is not 
cure and long, long life. It is about a human life, however short that is. And so it is applicable throughout the course of, it, of an illness according to the patient's need. And it can be provided with disease modifying therapies whenever needed. For example, something like physiotherapy here to prevent contractures is a very valid thing to do. We won't say, oh, her prognosis is not good, so maybe we should not do anything like that. I mean, of course, we have already illustrated that the problem here is also, even though they're a rich family, they don't have money. And, you know, so when the uncle asks the uh, niece, okay, you are saying all this we can do, but uh, we don't know whether we can afford it. Uh, unlike many other things in healthcare, for palliative care, affordability is not the greatest barrier to access. Okay? Uh, it is various other things. And also, you know, there is a range of affordability in which palliative care can be provided. And generally speaking, our goal should be to provide it in the most affordable way. Remember, like over here, even wealthy families do not have unlimited resources. And most of us know that in our own lives, you know, when we are trying to run our homes and our families. You know, the same cup of coffee can have a very different cost in a five-star hotel. And that difference in cost is not worth difference in value. Then the question comes, okay, like now we have palliative care specialists and palliative care volunteers and MD palliative care people. Uh, so, you know, isn't it something that they do? So maybe I might ask them the question. Should basic life support be taught only to the MD general medicine specialists? And of course, they'll say no, because, you know, anybody may suddenly collapse and the more number of people who know how to resuscitate that person, the better the outcome will be. Similarly, whatever discipline and whatever specialty of healthcare we are in, either at work or in our society, we will see people who face death. And so basic palliative care cannot be left only to the specialists. So then we can ask them a question. So now your family has told you that you are the only healthcare professional here. So what help does the grandmother need? Imagine if you were the grandmother, what were the kind of helps you would need other than the euthanasia? Who can provide that help? And what resources do those caregivers need? Okay. Sometimes they'll come up with a simple answer, home nurse. Well, first of all, everybody cannot afford a home nurse. For most people, the home nurse is the family member. And anyway, whoever is providing that nursing, what do they need? How to provide, they need some knowledge, they may need some drugs. They may need a little bit of equipment. They may need rest. You know how in some families, one daughter-in-law will be burdened with the full care. They may need someone to encourage them. They may need people who don't blame them. There are so many different things they need. So we can ask the students to come up with some of these lists. If you want, you can even ask them to work out a role play of how to explain this. Okay. So, what, all this helps us to see that what are the things the medical student can do and what are the things he cannot do now, but which would be good for him to learn. And after they have brainstormed and come up with a few things, maybe we, especially if we are dividing them into groups or otherwise we can just ask them individually to pick one. Few of the common issues that are faced. What can be done to help with the limbs? Mobility, she may not be able to walk, but you know, how can she eat? How can she be taken for a bath? How can she sit outside for a little time and get some fresh air? Pain, desire for death, 
maybe if she's no longer isolated, if she's communicating with her grandchildren, some of that desire for death may go. So what can you do for each of these things? You can even ask them to look it up on the net and come up with some solutions. So after they have come up with some of these solutions, then maybe we can get them thinking about another question. Can healthcare itself cause serious health related suffering? Yes or no? We all know that it can. We can also ask them, okay, uh, tell us how it can cause physical health, how healthcare can cause physical suffering, emotional suffering, social suffering, spiritual suffering. And you know, these students are quite smart. So they may come up with examples of treatment toxicity, examples of time toxicity, where somebody with two months left to live is spending four days a week roaming around the hospital. Financial toxicity we've talked about. Emotional toxicity. Just, you know, we have to admit that not all healthcare professionals are empathetic. Sometimes we hear some very harsh things. Dignity toxicity, when against your will, you're lying half naked with tubes around. Uh, when people are talking as if you are an object, when people are doing things to you without telling you what they are doing. So there are various ways in which healthcare itself can also cause serious health related suffering, isn't it? And I think it's an important question to ask students because at least for a few of them, it might be a prophylactic to them inflicting these forms of suffering. And just if we look at financial toxicity alone, in 2018, Bangladesh and India are among the 12 countries in the world where the cost of ill health compounds suffering the most. 55 million Indians are pushed below poverty annually. Now in this uh, grandmother's family, they haven't been pushed below poverty. So there are many, many more millions who are facing other kinds of loss, resulting in multi-generational debt. Has there been multi-generational debt in this case scenario? In a way, isn't it? Because that cousin is not going to go to go the professional college which they had hoped to. That cousin's life story has become different because of healthcare expenses. Then we say that, you know, palliative care is not euthanasia. It respects life, but it also respects that death is a part of life. And then we can turn to another case scenario where our learning objective is a little different and where the family is a little different. So this example is of an elderly man with lung cancer and brain metastasis, refractory lung cancer, who has come to the emergency department. He's completed treatment. His clinical condition is very poor. He's unconscious. And prior to this, the patient had repeatedly said, don't take me back to hospital since I know my disease is incurable. But the family insists that he should be admitted in the ICU and put on a ventilator. So then you can ask the student, so what will you communicate with this family? And they may come up with various answers. But I think it's important for us to stress the point that before they start preaching to the patient or giving advice, they have to acknowledge, they have to listen. They have to acknowledge that they understand that the family wants to do the best for their father. Then they need to clarify, why do you want to put him in ICU? What are you hoping for from ICU care? And that clarification is important because different families may want ICU for different reasons. Somebody might say, my sister is coming after two days from America. That is a little more understandable. But what does this family want? So this family tells us, we know the prognosis and we were looking after him at home. And we were, you know, but 
But another relative came and told me when he became unconscious, how can you just keep him at home like that? When my wife had breast cancer and became unconscious with fever, we took her to the ICU and now she's fine. So you see again that thing of, are you doing enough? Huh? My father is the one who has given me everything in my life. How can I not do the best for him? So the son says, doctor, I'm ready to sell my house even to do the best for my father. So you don't worry about the cost. Now, difficult situation because there can be hospitals which will be very happy to, in effect, become the ones who buy that house, you know, or the money that comes from selling that house. But with our young students, we want them to, again, like I said, be, have a prophylaxis to that kind of unethical practice. So again, we can give them an exercise. Weigh the benefits and burdens of ICU care. So when you had that uncle's wife, this uncle's wife had a curable breast cancer and you know her counts dropped and she got a neutropenic sepsis and she went to ICU and she recovered. But this grandfather has progressive disease with an organ failure. And we know that with disseminated cancer, if you have incurable disease and multi-organ involvement, they're not going to come out alive and walking from the ICU. But we don't tell them that yet. We ask them, okay, what are the benefits and burdens of ICU care? In terms of medical toxicity, financial toxicity, etc., etc. And you know, these students are smart. They'll usually come up with things. So that helps them to understand that withholding potentially inappropriate treatment might be the ethical thing to do. It is not the question of not doing the best. Okay? So out of proportion or disproportionate treatment, non-beneficial treatment, inadvisable treatment, interventions aimed at cure that greater that carry greater possibilities of harm than reasonable possibilities of benefit. Because remember, not every situation is so black and white. Sometimes it will be a little more gray. Those are examples of potentially inappropriate treatment. And like we said before, palliative care respects life, but also accepts death as a part of life. Then finally, we can leave them with the question, how many of us will never die? Mm -hmm. And, you know, even in the, even all the staff in their medical colleges, all the patients who come to their big hospitals, someday or the other, they are going to die. And at some point or the other, some of them at least, may be better served by getting appropriate palliative care. Some of them may be better served by appropriately withholding treatment that can cause serious health related suffering. And some of them, of course, will be better served by getting appropriate curative care. And we will have more resources for curative care if we don't use it inappropriately for others. Isn't it? both in terms of ICU beds and also in terms of what families are willing to do. What the father, what the son has spent on his elderly father today, maybe what he may not have when his wife is ill tomorrow. And I'll just, then you can even give them a little job. Find a directory of palliative care services in India. So you've got a couple of good directories. Pallium India has one. The Indian Association of Palliative Care has one. What are the palliative care services in the district where your grandparents live? You can ask them to come back with that. And, you know, then you might find some wide range of answers. Now, this has two, three advantages. One, if they do have somebody who, whom they come across who needs care, they might refer them to that service. Two, a few may think, oh my goodness, see, look at that district that has so many. In my place, there is nothing. Maybe this is a little something which my family can do or uh, which I can do someday. You never know, you know, when you sow little seeds, what can happen. So this was an example of 
how one can take a complex and difficult subject, which an afternoon lecture can be very boring and very sleepy, to try and bring an attitudinal change, at least in a certain proportion of them. And uh, if I have time, I might also play one video. Yes, I defeated diabetes. We'll have to just I have successfully this, uh, reversed my diabetes. This this one, we'll just wait for the just let me see if I can take that video for you. Ma'am, as they go around, can you see it? Uh, Ma'am, we can uh, we can hear the audio, but we can't hear. We can see the video. Okay, I'll try it again. Around. You can just say, as you are walking around this hospital. Hi, casually. I'm Judith Heller, and I'm proud to oversee physician recruitment at the Northwell Health System. I'm pleased to partner with our clinical leaders. Now I'd like to share with you their vision okay. for growth. As you're walking around this hospital, casual, casually, happily, having fun, I just remember that those whom you see may be going through something very, very different. And uh, so that I think might be how I might take this session. Thank you. Uh, thank you, ma'am. There is a, a chat about the video, a uh, very heart touching video by Dr. Umesh. I don't know if we have time for questions, uh, Dr. Sri Devi. Ma'am, if you have time, if people can stay back for five more minutes, uh, I think uh, we can take up a few questions. There's a lot of security knowing that the system that you're working for. Ma'am, I think the video is playing in your laptop, so we can. Yes, yes, I'll just stop that. Yeah. Thank you. So if there are any questions before ma'am leaves, uh, please feel free to ask. I, I remember Dr. Usha was asking about how to uh, teach this to students, especially uh, I, I remember she's in community medicine and they have a family adoption program. So how to teach uh, students. Uh, so I was mentioning very briefly that that's the right uh, uh, platform to show them or introduce this particular topic uh, anything, empathy, communication, patient. Uh, Ma'am, would you like to comment on that? No, absolutely. See, the best, I think the most long lasting and most powerful way to introduce it would be actually to see a patient at home, okay? Or maybe a patient getting some kind of community-based care. But when we are asked to take this topic for 100 students in one hour with no previous background in it, and when the time we have for interaction is limited, then we have to try other ways of introducing it. And again, often from that group, you can say, how many of you would like to do a home visit? How many of you might want to come to a palliative care center? Because again, for these visits, I think rather than taking inflicting 100 students on 
a patient, you are better off taking the ones who are actually more motivated. Any other questions uh, from participants? Thank you, Kalindi. Can't see more questions. Sure, sure. Thank you so much, ma'am, for your time and uh, doing the session for this group. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, and the group members, please stay back with me for a few more minutes about the, uh, the activities for tomorrow. We'll be sharing. Uh, the, so I'm sure you might have, if you have paid attention, Dr. Jayaprakash was mentioning about the distribution of aid comp and how the clinical and preclinical departments can get involved in teaching aid comp modules. And you have gone through a, a training recently um, in FCPM where we have heard a lot about communication and ethics. And that is exactly what is being mentioned in the aid comp modules also. So we expect you to uh, get involved. Uh, if, if you are in the preclinical department, department, I'm sure you already will be involved in teaching eight core modules. If you are not involved, clinical departments can also approach these departments and say, can I take one module on communication? That is how we plan or we expect you to integrate the learnings that you had in the last few weeks to the undergraduate medical education. And you have seen how uh, important it is to have early uh, clinical exposure, uh, preclinical exposure, right? That is where I think where you all, the clinical departments can pitch in. And as he mentioned, you don't need to be uh, uh, working in a clinical department or a non-clinical department. Everyone can pitch in for uh, joining. So please be in touch with your medical education department or any preclinical departments and offer, just ask for one session in communication or ethics. We will provide you all the resource materials. We will provide you with PPTs, uh, reading materials, videos, links to movies, including a trainer's guide. So today evening, we'll be sharing all those resource materials. So there is a clear cut trainer's guide. For example, for one hour session, what all you need to take, including the PowerPoint, uh, the audio, the, the microphone, everything is mentioned. You just have to follow whether it is a must know or need to know in 8.com. We have done the mapping also, like where exactly in CBME or 8COM it is being mentioned. So if someone is asking you, why do you want to teach this? You can tell it is mentioned in this particular area. So we have done the mapping. Uh, we have uh, created all the resource materials for you to go and teach. If you are not confident to use those materials, we will be providing you with recorded sessions from experts. So you can maybe use that recorded session and you can facilitate discussion. You can pause in between and ask questions to the students. So we are providing you with all the materials. For communication module, we'll be sharing that by today uh, after the session. So for tomorrow, we'll, we have five groups. I'll put you five topics in the group. So for example, group one will be having a topic called empathy. Group two will have collusion. Group three will have basic communication skills. Group four, CBN, communicating bad news. And group five will have managing emotions. So I'll put it uh, in the WhatsApp group. So each group, I want you to go through the materials that we share uh, by today evening. There are a lot. So next tomorrow, you, you, you will be in your individual groups. You have to come up with a plan, a teaching learning plan for MBBS students in communication skills based on this topic. So group one will be coming up with a plan on how to teach empathy. You can use our materials. You can take anything from that. Or if you all, some of you might be already teaching all this in your institute. You might be already using some videos and lectures. So please have a small group and you will be discussing on the group that how to teach empathy for first year medical students or how to teach uh, communicating bad news to the third year medical students. Because you can't teach communicating bad news during the foundation course, right? They have to have at least some clinical exposure before you introduce the communicating bad news part. So in the small groups, you will be doing that. And we'll come back to the larger group after 30 minutes. And you will be sharing your experience so that everyone can adopt their teaching learning methods. 
uh, I hope I am clear. If there are any questions, I can I can take it up. So I'll just quickly repeat. There will be five groups. Five groups will have five different topics under communication and ethics. We'll be largely covering communication. Each group will have to come up with a teaching learning plan under their topic. You, you will be given all the materials that we have created. This is created by a group of experts in the country. So uh, you have everything available, uh, will be available in that folder. So please go through it uh, tonight quickly before tomorrow's session, or you can come up with your own materials also. Uh, if there are any questions, please post it in the group. I'll answer those questions. And this is this Dr. Jay Prakash uh, session. That is where exactly we want you to go and start, uh, start interacting with the MBBS students. Now you all are trained. You all have an idea about uh, what we are going to do. You all are trained in communication skills or pain management. We want you to pitch in in your own institution and start taking this up uh, in, in those institutions. I can see a chat. Yes. So where will the group members please feel free to start your own WhatsApp groups. But that's why we send the uh, group division earlier. And that's why I told, please get to know your group members. Just uh, it is shared in the uh, 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 in the WhatsApp. You belong to which group and which all will be your co-group members. Some of you might be from the same institution. Some of you might be from different, different institutions. So you should learn from each other. In your institution, some methodology will work better. So you can share that learning with the other group or some of the clinical members may not be involved in teaching at all in ITCOM. So you can share your learning to them. So please communicate with each other. Uh, this is a team building work also. So find your partners, create a group and discuss. Uh, excuse yes. me, ma'am. Ma yes. Is it possible at your end if you create the groups and you add the people because not everyone has mentioned their name with the phone number in the WhatsApp thing. Yeah, so we, we'll be uh, doing that from our end. So group one, two, three, four, five, and we'll add the group members to that. Uh, and we'll put on the topic uh, for each group also in that. So please. So we have 30 minutes. So you can have a basic understanding, a, a kind of team building between yourself in the WhatsApp group. Tomorrow we have 30 minutes to discuss that online and then you will be coming back to the uh, in the breakout rooms and then you will be coming back to the uh, larger group and discussing them and there will be experts like dr veena she'll be giving your her inputs like what all challenges she faced or if she has anything more to uh, uh, suggest she'll be giving her inputs also so that is how it is going to happen in the next three days so it is very important to be in the group otherwise one group will have only two members and the other group will have seven members and you will just uh, be aware Thank you so much. As soon as the session is over, we'll uh, be sharing all the contents in the IECO and we'll be dividing the groups and giving the talks. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for joining in. Uh, so, see you tomorrow with another interactive and informative session. Till then, this is Ripriya along with Dr. Sridevi Varya. Signing off from the Tips of Call. See you tomorrow again. Bye bye.